Susan, I'm so so excited to be here with you today. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah. And um, one of the things that um, I love about what you talk about, what you write about, is um, is how uh, how human uh, the human aspect comes together with data and security and technology and and all of these different uh, many facets. Um, and I want to get into all that. But before we do, I'd love to know how you got started. Hmm. How did you become an analyst? How does a person become an analyst? Is it something you prepared for and you wanted your whole life, or did it just happen yeah. to you one day and you were like, wow, okay, I'm an analyst? No, I don't I don't think it came up in the middle school career fair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who knows what came up then? No, it's funny. I mean, I was always kind of a studious person. Um, and when I finished college, I thought I was naturally going to go to graduate school and I was going to teach poetry in some like leafy, you know, Eastern college and uh, and then I discovered that that actually there were no jobs doing that at mm. the time I graduated and so since I lived in San Francisco I thought well I guess I better you know find a job and so I went to apply, apply for a job which I thought was a grant writing job at a nonprofit but it turned out to be that proposal writing was proposal writing for a sales organization and as a result of that, I got into a lot of sort of corporate communication, marketing communication, and that sort of thing. And I did that for quite a long time. But I felt kind of, un I felt a little bit of unrest about it, because I really wanted to get back to sort of looking at problems deeply. And I was lucky enough to meet Charlene Lee. Um, I was a client of hers a couple times when she was at Forrester, and when she and Jeremiah, uh, back in those days, were starting Altimeter Group. And I essentially begged them to hire me, yeah. uh, because I wanted to focus on a bot, a create a body of work. I was so interested in the impact of the internet on business and society and media, and I felt that I had something to give. So that's that's how I ended up doing what I'm doing. So I'm basically a wannabe academic. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are. Yeah. Um, and even the academics are. <laughs> um, so when you, um, when you get, you gave a TED Talk that was so impactful. I was lucky enough to be uh, in the audience and hear you give this wonderful um, uh, presentation and conversation around um, data and how it, uh, how how you discovered certain things through your son, um, yeah. and and that was so awesome. Um, how how did you now in the backstory because um, you only have so many minutes to t to give a TED talk, but in the backstory, what walk me through that? Um, what what did that feel like when you're uh, discovering this through questions and through the process sure. of your son? Yeah, it was a really, it's funny because when I, um, you know, I was asked to submit for TED and I, I thought, well, this is never going to happen. So I'm just going to use it as an opportunity to maybe like, you know, f sort of think through a few things. Mm. And a lot of that TED Talk is actually kind of what was going on in the back of my head over the course of the last couple of years. So, you know, my son, um, who's now 12 and, you know, tall and awesome, you know, at the time was uh, when I told that story was, was about almost four. And, uh, you know, and things looked really different then. And I, and I kept thinking that there's this mismatch between the way that, you know, institutional organizations look at the data about him and what we see when we look at him. And I also thought about, you know, other ways in which this can be true. And because I'm kind of a big reader, I thought about, like, you know, the dystopian universe of, like, Huxley and Orwell and William Gibson and all these other people. And I thought, and I also thought like a lot of the conversation about data, it's just so dry and so focused on engineering and processing. And like, and there's genius in that. It's just, this doesn't happen to be my thing or my, you know, my particular skill. And so that story that I told, I never really intended it. Like it wasn't part of what I intended to tell in the TED Talk at the beginning. And there was a point at which I was writing this, this piece uh, almost like a one, it's almost like a one person show when you do TED because you have to memorize it. And I, I got to a point and I thought, oh my gosh, I think I'm going to tell a story here about Isaac. And so, and so I wrote it out and then I, and then I spoke with the producer, uh, Juliet Blake, who we both know and adore. And, and I was really kind of ambivalent about including it because I felt, it felt very personal. And I also didn't want to be making like a grand statement, right? Except to say that people are so much more complex than sometimes we can understand through data. And maybe we need to change the way that we observe in order to be able to accommodate the changes in the digital world that we live in. And remind me, your, your son is autistic. Yep, yep. And you discovered through the power of 
questions? That yeah, so I'll tell you the story. So basically, he's autistic. He was diagnosed when he was about two. Um, he was very slow to speak. He wasn't a, a particularly, um, you know, he didn't have a lot of the, the sort of gestural language and stuff like that. So he was picked up pretty early on a lot of those diagnostics. And, you know, when you've got a two-year-old, you don't know what that two-year-old's going to look like in five minutes, much less five years. Um, and then one day we happened upon him in the, um, you know, he, he liked to play on the computer. I'm like, how much trouble can the kid get into? And and we walk in and he's looking at pictures of women, like images on Google image search. And I had no idea how he'd gotten there. And then and then I looked at the search bar and it said, you know, W-I-M-E-N. <laughs> and I just kept pushing back until, and I realized he'd been searching for things that he was interested in, schools and buses and computers, you know, using four-year-old spelling. And I thought, you know, as I said in the, in the, in the talk, like he was actually fully asking questions of his universe. He just wasn't doing it in the way that we've been accustomed to hearing. And so then I thought, well, if he's doing this and he's kind of finding his own like really smart workaround, like what else are we missing? And that made me think about what else are we missing in the physical world when we, you know, as marketers or, le you know, legal professionals or HR people or even employees, if we're trying to solve a problem, like, what are we missing? Mm -hmm. So that, that was kind of what made, that was my passion about the talk and, and what sort of, I think, made it mm -hmm. um, resonate with people. But also, it was, it's the piece that I think is so hard, right? Because mm -hmm. you never know what your frame of reference is excluding from you. Mm -hmm. So um, now taking that and looking at your career, and you've spoken all over the world, and you've written papers and, and put so much effort into uh, that as a foundation for what you're doing, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's awesome to see, but at the same time, it makes you uh, curious about where things are heading, right, um, yeah. in terms of, like, like, uh, like security, it's such a complex issue, right. um, and I know that's one of the things that you're really looking at is is security. Um, what around security is it that that you're fascinated with? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, there's physical security, you know, information security, cyber security, and all of that stuff. And I, I wouldn't say. I mean, I'm certainly not an expert in, in in that. But the piece that I'm really interested in and looking at a lot is around privacy and ethical data use and the way that the way that we as an as a culture have and as a as a sort of an industry have grown up in the past 20 years to use data in the way that we have so right now you know we're sitting in this room and we've got phones somewhere and the phones know where we are and they know where we've been my phone knows that i was on caltrain this morning because i looked at the app and also because it saw me moving through time uh, it knows what restaurants are near me i haven't had to do anything for that 20 years ago if i was going to take the train and we we're going to have this conversation when we were both, you know, six, um, <laughs> you know, I would have had to go to the computer, open up the web, you know, look and see when the timetable was, probably print it out. And that's all the record that there would have been. Nobody would have known where I was for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that's really interesting to me about the world that we're living in now is that we're collecting, you know, as industries are collecting, and the government, of course, collecting all of this data about us. And yet, you know, the idea that maybe there's even like a, a digital kind of microbiome, right? Like, mm. you know, have you heard about the microbiome where like we're walking around and apparently in a cloud of bacteria, which is something that nobody wants to think about. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's data that's sort of ambient around us. Mm -hmm. And what really um, I find really arresting about that is, you know, what's what do consumers and citizens and individuals, like what, what role do they have to play? And who gets to decide? Because the law is not going to do it. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's really it's really a big deal now because you when you when something like you know a health insurance company or a retailer gets breached, you know, you start to see how quickly you can put together a picture about somebody. Mm -hmm. But it's the stuff that's like a little less visible that I think is really the most interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, not only because like there are brilliant people who are handling the security aspect of things. Mm -hmm. And and so um, it's funny that you mentioned uh, visible um, and and um, visual because that's the other side of this, right? The the whole visual aspect to yeah. the web and how do we take something that we can't see yeah. and and make it visual, make it a visible thing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So have you been looking at that as? Yeah, so, so you know, one of the things I think, like if we, if we, we look back on this time 50 years from now, mm. we'll see it as the beginning of the digital histor historical record. Like one of the things Chris Moody, who's the VP of um, data strategy at Twitter says, which I think is really, really fascinating is that, you know, our history is being written in social data today, yeah. right? You know, our history is being written in, on Facebook, and you know, they always say history is written by the victors, right? Well, the victors are the ones who have access to digital tools, digital media, and it's on Twitter, and it's on Facebook, and it's on Snapchat, even though it's disappearing, <laughs> we hope, and mm -hmm. you know, and all these other places. And some of that is is language that we use, and of course there are hundreds, if not like sometimes people say a thousand languages in the world, probably a couple hundred that are used every day, or used most commonly. And it's hard enough to understand language, it's hard enough for you and me who speak the same language, you know, native speakers of the same language to always understand each other, mm -hmm. so much harder when you transfer that across cultures. But the thing that's really fascinating is of course with, when you look at, the, at mobile and you look at social, What's the biggest, fastest growing kind of medium? It's visual, mm. it's images. And so you think about, like I was thinking, you know, it's the end of the year, so we're all thinking back on the year and the sort of, you know, iconic images of the year. And one of them was the image of that poor um, Kurdish kid from Syria who washed up on the beach in Turkey, um, along Kurdi. And, um, that image became, like it was viewed like by 20 million people immediately uh, once it was released, and it became really iconic. And um, there's a woman actually out of University of Sheffield named Farida Viz, who's a brilliant, um, brilliant scholar, and she's been looking at like, what does it mean about this image, and how can we use our understanding of the way that images travel to be able to prevent, you know, horrible things like this from happening in the future. And so that has application for society and culture, and it has application for marketers who want to understand when their brand shows up, you mm -hmm. know, in an image, in an Instagram, mm -hmm. you know, whether you're Coca-Cola or Louis Vuitton. When, when um, with, with all of this um, great knowledge that you have now, you've looked into all these, you've really been been hired to, to dig into all this great information. But when you look at all of it and you look at the security, especially around what's even going on right now publicly around our government and everything that's going on, what um, what scares you the most? What what kind of, you know, intimidates or should intimidate us? Um, and how do we how do we correct that? Yeah. You know, I think um we, you know, Gartner Group released their um, hype cycle for 2015. That's not the thing that scares me, by the way. <laughs> Great job with the, with the hype cycle, guys. But at the top of it this year is the Internet of Things, the top, the peak of inflated expectations. And one of the really interesting things that happened with the hype cycle is that big data is gone. And things like autonomous vehicles are kind of coming mm. up, and neuro business. Please, somebody has to tell me what that means. <laughs> uh, we know what neuro marketing is, right? So let's assume we know what neuro business is. Um, what is neuro marketing? I'm, I'm not oh, even sure. Oh, just like trying to understand like the the neurological processes that people have when they see, you know, marketing media business. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, neuro business is like mm -hmm. way outside something that I really understand. Although now that I've discovered what you know discovered it there, I'm I'm curious to know what it is. Yeah. But all of these, you know, all of these new emerging technologies are built on algorithms. And an algorithm at its most fundamental level is a recipe mm -hmm. for making a decision or for inferring something and then making a decision based upon it. And if we are concerned about understanding data, then we need to be even more concerned, and I don't necessarily mean that in a critical or you know frightening way, but we need to be even more invested in really making sure that the way that we encode our assumptions in the future are good for business, good for society, good for humanity, good for human rights, and all those types of things. And so, you know, uh, I'm sure everybody's heard that you know Elon Musk and Reid Hoffman and Peter Thiel have just started the Open AI project. Um, there are controversies about this idea called the singularity that one day machines will overcome humans. It's very much a, you know, Blade Runner kind of, you know, Blade Runner kind of world that we're potentially hurtling toward. Um, does that does that scare you? It, it kind of, you know, what scares me is it, what scares me is actually 
bigotry encoded in science and algorithms, right? Wow. So bigotry encoded in business. So somebody I know, this really cool guy, Sean Walker from the University of Washington, like he looks at things like the politics of databases. In fact, there's a woman at Berkeley, um, Anna Lauren Hoffman, who's a trans woman who does this too. And so imagine the consequences of a database in which there are only two options for gender. Now, of course, Facebook has been looking at this and Facebook just actually, I think, uh, created some kind of a, a, a review process for people who don't want to use their real names for various reasons, mm. um, but there has, you know, but there are multiple options for gender because now we understand, or hopefully we're beginning to understand, that there are multiple ways that people identify themselves, to the point of not wanting to specify gender at all. Mm. But if you only give people two choices, it's a binary, then you are removing all of this context about an individual that's important to them. And if you're, I mean, let's just be super commercial about it for a second. That if you're a business, might be relevant to you too. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're marketing to a trans woman, there may be ways that you want to be sensitive or or differentiated in the way that you market to her versus if you market to someone who is, you know, cisgender, meaning that they were they're born and identify in that in the gender that they were born with. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when I think about what scares me, it's that technology is way out ahead of our laws. It's way out ahead of our ethical frameworks. Mm. Uh, sometimes it's way out ahead of our imagination almost, mm. like the possibilities that we can uh, use it for. And what I worry about is that we need to catch up or we need to be thinking about the potential disparate impacts of uh, people who have economic disadvantage or have other issues. And then also, frankly, you know, because we're all, you know, in, in the business world here, we need to be thinking about ways in which we can create businesses that sustain themselves and that actually can innovate mm-hmm. using all of these technologies in a, in a way that's that's actually, you know, productive. Mm-hmm. Um, and that and that engenders, you know, back to trust, right? That engenders mm-hmm. trust from both sides. Yeah. Oh, so you, you're 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 helping me. You're throwing me softballs here because that's exactly what I was going to ask you about. Is back on that topic of trust. Um, where where will trust? Um, where what define trust for me in this era? I mean, I, I, we we all get what trust is between people, but sure. trust with data, trust with um, technology, trust as it as it starts to evolve. Are we going to lose trust or, or gain trust, and how do we keep it? You know, the hard thing about talking about trust is that I don't think, like, I don't think there's a human being on the planet, you know, who's really, you know prepared to understand what trust really is Hmm. Um, in the sense that, well, in the sense that, you know, it's a lot of different things to a lot of people. But I want to talk about a particular kind of focus of trust, which is the trust between individuals and organizations, Hmm. because there's sort of a social contract we enter into when we buy a mobile phone, we buy shoes, we buy cookware, we Mm -hmm. do all these things, right? And some of them may be trivial or, or, you know, we vote, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them may be Mm trivial-ish, right? So I get retargeted. I bought some cookware from a retailer who, which will all remain nameless <laughs> and I am getting like a hundred thousand emails and ret- you know every it's like it's like it's stalking me through the right. internet you know it's annoying it's not that big a deal mm-hmm. but it's it's something that's making an inference about me mm-hmm. based on my uh, based on my data now the trust thing is is really about how can we make sure because people you know there have been studies done, many, many studies done that show that um, trust is being eroded in certain areas. And one of them that people may have heard of is the Edelman Trust Barometer, which they do mm-hmm. every year to you know, about three, I don't even know how many people, but it's NGOs and, gov- and governments and um, business people and consumers. Mm-hmm. And one of the places where trust is eroding is around technology, and I'm suspecting that, that that's around data use. Mm-hmm. Annenberg did a study about this. Um, they found that, you know, we all, we all love to talk in the Valley about how, well, you know, would you have Gmail if it weren't? Weren't for the fact that they're mining your your emails for AdWords? Well, no. You know, I mean, do you want to pay for email? No, I don't want to pay for email. Mm-hmm. But the truth is that, you know, we don't know what we're paying in data. Mm-hmm. You know, when we interact with businesses, and so individuals have to have some way to feel that they've got some control and feel that they are 
in a mutual relationship. And I think that mm -hmm. gets to a lot of the work that Kari Ander Anderson has mm -hmm. done and a lot of the human-to-human -human stuff that you've done. And it all circles around the same thing, which is that fundamentally technology is in the service of humans, not vice versa. Mm -hmm. And um, and that we have to get better when we think about data use. We have to get better at thinking about it in a more sustainable way. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's pivot just a little bit and um, talk about um, how you see the future in um, artificial intelligence. <laughs> um, yeah, because that's something that is going to be um, and and actually not even just artificial intelligence, but how um, how we're served, um, how how this all plays together. So so we have this concept of trust. We've got artificial intelligence, which comes in many different forms, and then we have this idea, this concept around personalization. Right. Um, something that we all desire is to be personalized with an approach, so that it's not retargeted every time. Right. It's when we need it. It's exactly what we need when we need it without being creepy. Right. So how do, how, how do all these things start to come together in a way? And why aren't we there yet? It seems yeah. like we should be, no? Yeah, although it's really complex, right? So you yeah. think about, you know, if you think about all the different ways that businesses know you, you know, you probably live in dozens, if not hundreds, of databases for the businesses that you interact with. There's an email marketing database. There's... Um, you know, there's CRM, there's business intelligence that's capturing your transactions, there's market research if you've been surveyed or done a customer satisfaction survey, there's all the social data which could be coming from multiple um, multiple platforms, there's sensors maybe, you know, there could be beacon devices, shelf weights, there could be your phone as a sensor, has sensors. Mm -hmm. Pulling all that stuff in and figuring out what it means, I mean, that's, that's a lot, right? So if you even think about, for example, you know, email marketing versus social. So in social, I say, hey, I'm thinking about buying some new cookware. I go and visit the web. I look at, you know, three different retailers. I check their prices. I check their inventory. Okay, that's probably, I search for it, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm now in a bunch of different places so that you can probably pretty much infer like I'm looking for cookware. Mm -hmm. The hard part is, when did I buy it? Only the person who has the transaction knows that I bought it. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is still like, you know, saucepan. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you th abstract that one little thing that's maybe three or four different data streams and you think about moving through your life, um, the decisions that you make, the services that you need, the people that you need, the help that you need, the, um, the biases or preferences that you have, you and I may be really different. You may be far more open than I am on social networks. Um, you may be far more happy to share information for longer periods of time. Uh, you may have different points of view about what your, um, you know, what you will, what photos you'll post, and whether you want to be tagged. And somewhere, somebody, some system needs to be tracking all of that stuff so that you and I can have a differentiated experience through every single touch point, that's crazy. That's why it's so hard, right? Yeah. It's a data problem. It's a thought problem. It's a systems problem. It's a processing problem. And we right now, I mean, you look at the ethics, for example, of autonomous cars, that's a fairly restricted thing that a car does, and yet look how complex it is, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So... I think Talk about trust. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, we're moving to a we're moving to a world in which it's not that we have to trust more than we did before, but we have to trust in different things. We have to trust in algorithms to work in a way that is essentially unprecedented. Mm -hmm. Can the algorithm can an algorithm um, think for itself? Or, I mean, is there a, this, this potential of an algorithm taking over and and you know, doing what it thinks it needs to do, or is it input only? <sighs> It, it's interesting. I, I have heard a number of really s smart people who I trust uh, on a, ra say a range of things. I think that um, the, the best way of thinking about it is that there will always be a kind of symbiotic relationship between people and algorithms, right? Because the world changes all the time. The world that we live in, you know, I saw Carol the other night. We would not want to build a world based on the assumptions of that, of, you know, whatever, the 1950s, right? So even now, the, the, the things that are 
interesting us as a culture are so different from what interested us even in October. Mm -hmm. And so we need people to be able to continue to say what's important. Now, if it's you tend to buy a car every three years, you've had your car for two and a half years, algorithm says time to market to Brian, like I'm comfortable with that, mm -hmm. you know, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, if it says, you know, here's what we've been eating, here's how much we've been moving, here's our DNA, here's our propensity to get certain illnesses, oh, here's the stuff that's over 70%, let's give you a higher interest rate or higher insurance rate. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily sure how comfortable I am with that. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to deal. We're all going to have to deal. Mm -hmm. But those are kinds of the mm -hmm. decisions that we have to sort of think about. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you see for the future for, and uh, this is kind of going to sound like a, um, uh, a bit of a song, a um, future for our kids, um, but what, what, how do you believe that, that um, their jobs are going to change now over time based upon what, um, what you're talking about? Um, you know, they've grown up with Pinch and Zoom. Uh, as a second, uh, sec you know, it's, it's second nature to them. Um, as they're starting to learn these skills that are totally different than, than what you and I grew up with, how's that going to change our business um, entities, you know, business lives? Um, where do you see that kind of playing a part here? Well, short of singing the greatest love of all. <laughs> That's the song I was trying to think of. I'm, Thank you. I believe the children are. <laughs> I mean, isn't that fairly self-evident, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're our future, too. Um, you know, I, I'm not a, I wish I were, I wish I were a wizard, you know? Yeah. But um, I would say, you know, if we, if we pay attention to what's happening now, we think about, like, the, this, the talk that we saw at TED this year, TED at IBM this year, Cheko Asakawa, um, a blind, brilliant blind woman who um, has created an augmented reality tool to help her move through physical spaces and without the need, I mean, probably still with the need of a cane, but without the need of an individual to guide her. I mean, how brilliant is that, mm -hmm. you know? I think that we're going to see more ways in which the digital world will layer on top of the physical world and help us, I hope help us, right, um, do things that maybe we couldn't have done otherwise. I think that we will see more information workers. Mm. Um, uh, we will see more people whose responsibility is to to translate physical the physical into the digital and vice versa. I hope that we'll see um, I hope that we'll see much more in terms of virtual medicine um, sharing information. Of course, that that happened even at the beginning of whatever YouTube back in 2005, right? People started sharing information about um, surgical procedures and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that we will have to decide individually how much technology is integrated into our lives. And you know, Charlene, who you know you know well, mm -hmm. has always said she wants to be first in line to be chipped when the chips right. come, right? Yeah. And I'm not sure I feel that way for myself. Um, I think that we will always have sensors in and around us, but there's nothing that beats the that wonderful experience of just getting out there and crunching through wet leaves or, you know, baking cookies in the kitchen or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it might be. So I think we will have to pay a lot of attention to artificial intelligence. We have, we will have to not be too credulous about what, what it can do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we have to remember that we may not always have the best judgment, but we have human judgment.